to Redirect Immigration Law and Perspectives, a weekly dive into the world of immigration law and its human consequences. I'm your host, Stephen Robbins, joined shortly by co-host and fellow immigration attorney Matthew Archambault out of the great city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This week, we're talking to Rachel Ida Buff. She's a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, UWM. Uh, She's got a book that's called uh, Against the Deportation Terror, Organizing for Immigrant Rights in the 20th Century. I think it's a a really kind of a critical book if you uh, want to understand where we are and sort of how we got here. Uh, On on the one hand, I think it's it's true that we, we often feel that things like immigration laws are sort of sacrosanct and and written in stone. And what you'll find is that, in fact, uh, they've sort of just been made up as we go. <laughs> and uh, these things have a start. They have a genesis, right? What What is the genesis? Where do they come from? Why do we have these laws? And uh, are they worth having moving forward? I think those are all good questions. And reading a book like this helps you uh, understand the history and hopefully leads you to uh, the answers to those questions. Uh, and Matthew and I talk about uh, how people are dying in, in ICE custody and, and how that's a real problem and conditions are terrible. Uh, we talk about how those conditions aren't necessarily new, uh, but when you take a crappy system and uh, you dump a bunch of people into it or you decide that that crappy system is now going to uh, you know, carry even more weight or burden, uh, that's a real problem. And uh, I think that we're starting to see that. So uh, we have a, a fun conversation at the end, I think. And, and uh, Professor Buff is great, too. She's got a new book coming out uh, next year. A is for Asylum. That should be a good one, too. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Folks, if you like this show, here's what you can do. You can subscribe on iTunes or on Stitcher or on Spotify. Uh, Give us reviews and likes and thumbs up and all those things. Uh, You can tell your friends about the show. We're over on patreon.com slash redirect. That's where you can sign up to be a patron. What does that mean? That means that you can uh, kick a few dollars our way per month. And uh, by doing that, a couple things happen. For every hundred patrons we have, we take a a pro bono asylum case, uh, which is important because as we've talked about on this show, uh, people seeking asylum don't have a... Uh, a right to an attorney. They have a right to hire an attorney, but no attorney will be assigned, which means the judge will usually give them a hearing, maybe two, to find a lawyer. And if they don't, the judge will say, okay, person from El Salvador, uh, you are now your own lawyer. And uh, that could be the difference between winning or losing. So thanks to the support of our patrons, we're able to take uh, pro bono cases, more pro bono cases than we already do. Matthew and I do a lot of pro bono work already. Um, but uh, the support of our patrons allows us to take on even more, which is great. I do have this sort of like uh, fantasy of getting to a point where we have, you know, a thousand or two thousand patrons, and being able to to sort of dedicate a, a larger bulk of the practice to pro bono work, uh, because I'd be able to keep the lights on as an attorney. That's important. Pay the staff, right? Turns out they want to get paid. Uh, but but be providing services for free. Um, so that would be awesome. And what else can you do? Uh, we do have some merch over <laughs> at uh, redirect.threadless.com. You can get stickers and shirts and yoga pants. <laughs> That's right, yoga pants. So check that out too. And enjoy the conversation this week with Matthew and Professor but I like to get to know you. Yes, I would. But I like to get to know you. If I could. I want to know about you. So tell me about uh, where you come from and who you are. Okay, so I am, as you know, a history professor. I've lived in Milwaukee for 15 years and taught at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And during that time, I've been involved with Moses de la Frontera, which is our local workers' center immigrant rights organization. And, um, you know, I've always been an immigration-ish historian, but as I worked with Moses, I got more and more interested in where the heck this all came from. 
Um, and nobody could tell me. Nobody talks about it's sort of it's sort of weird because historians have done. I was thinking about this just yesterday. Historians have done really good work on sort of the, what they call the long civil rights movement. So we we historians don't think of civil rights as starting with Dr. King, right? We're like, oh, really? If you look at Reconstruction, or even if you go back to Jamestown and look at the first slave ships, there's a long history of this, the long freedom struggle, right? But nothing of the kind exists for immigrant rights. So we're constantly, those of us historians are not, we're constantly like, oh, look, there's, you know, 30,000 people marching through downtown Milwaukee. What's, what's up with that? You know, we have no context. So yeah, I got really, as I worked with the immigrant rights movement and did various things for them as a, you know, in my activist organizer life, I started w- wondering, you know, I think historians are people who are often vertically lonely, like, has anyone ever done this in time before? Is it just, is it just us? And something I think we can provide for movements is, yeah, you know, the people have done this, there were different contexts, but people have done this at different times in different ways. So that's, that's the genesis of that book. And I'm writing another book right now called A is for Asylum Seeker, which is intended to be a popular book. As my kids say, it's going to be a kind of thing you pick up, the hip consumer picks up in Urban Outsiders. Um, oh, wow. You know, that's just a, a glossary of the words since they're changing so freaking fast. And, you know, certain words that used to have certain meanings, like Asylum Seeker, as you well know, no longer have the same meaning. So this book that you so anyway. that, that we read, Against the Deportation Terror, Organizing for Immigrant uh-huh. Rights in the 20th Century... That's supposed to be your unpopular book, or I mean, you know, I think that's a, it's a heavy <laughs> lift for. I, I appreciate that you actually read it. Many of my non-academic friends and family were like, "Great, we're so happy," and they come to readings and stuff, and then they, you know, they have the book. You know, it's on the coffee table when I come over. <laughs> it's very the back is broken. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a dog ear on page five. Like I think academic prose, and I tried to write it well. But, you know, academic prose is a heavy list for most people, I think. One thing I, I wanted to sort of like uh, thank you for, and and I guess this is stating the obvious, but it it feels like with the Internet, we're, we develop this sense that like information is just there. Like if you want to know something, you can just Google it. But it does seem right. like what you're presenting is an unknown, a previously unknown history that this is stuff that could have easily been lost if uh if somebody wasn't around to to pull it all together so um thank you for doing that first of all uh, you know oh. what one thing that your your book got me thinking uh, there's this uh, activist in Tacoma named uh, Maru Villa uh I don't want to get it wrong uh Villa Pondo so she's a mm-hmm sort of an anti-ICE, anti-detention center activist who was, uh, after Trump was inaugurated, uh, put into removal proceedings because she's been sort of very vocally um, undocumented. And Mm -hmm. that felt like, uh, we talked about on this show, a a sort of dramatic departure from the norm. And the norm Mm -hmm. that we had developed was, you know, sort of the Obama administration. But your book... Uh, makes us understand that, in, if anything, this is a return to the norm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's really hard, and I listen fairly faithfully to the podcast. Um, I think it's hard not to think that what's going on now is fairly extraordinary. So, I, I, I just want to say, like this administration, let's give it its props. Like this is this is you know remarkably despicable. However, I also think that there's a playbook. And it gets used again and again. And so what I try to do in the book, because I was thinking about activists and lawyers. Lawyers are big heroes of mine, immigration lawyers in the book. You know, they, you know they, they're just heroic in terms of, you know, keeping the movement going and, and thinking of strategies and, and, and like doing between to get Matthew people out of and I, Where would you have us ranked? And between like Matthew and I, where would you have us ranked, would you say, like on the You know, like list? I have to say Ira Gullivan – you know, he was a lawyer for the American Committee for 70 years. Oh, no, no. I meant you know, Matthew, so, Matthew and I. Oh, oh, who's better? Y- yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know, Steve. Like, I mean, you, you said you you're seem like you're more lit. consistent, but Matthew has that silly gravitas that's really impressive. That's, that's a plus call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, 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 I would have to look at, I the, am, I, am. I would look at the archives. Yeah, I am yeah, here, I am here, so. so. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. You have, you have that silly seriousness. And I would have to look at your archival records. I mean, that's what, that's all we got as historians. We have like, I tell my students, we have one trick, which is you can say in an argument, well, in the past, you know, that's what you get three credits and that ability. Right. So, um, I would have to look at your archival records. Okay. I totally Google, 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 Google me. Google me. <laughs> I, to- I totally derailed your very interesting thought about lawyers as heroes. So, so, well, so lawyers like, do turn out to be heroes. But um, so there is a playbook, you know. Like I, I, I try to point out in the conclusion that what they did to Asmia O'Day successfully, you know, resulting in her deportation two years ago, they did they did the exact same thing to Harry Bridges. You know, they said, "Yeah, you naturalized, but you didn't mean it." Like what the heck, right? Like, you know, you couldn't possibly have meant that you could be an American citizen. It's kind of like you, you weren't being monogamous with us because you love the Communist Party. It's the exact same thing to Rasmia O'Day. You were always a terrorist. You never, you never loved us, the U.S. You always loved whatever the opposite is, terrorism more. You know, and that, that denaturalization, deportation playbook, that's really familiar. So there are some moves that they make consistently. And I think that's why often, I'm sure this happens too, often when I speak in public, you know, people are like, well, you know, Trump is so terrible. And like, well, Obama was sort of so terrible too, the deporter in chief, right? And, you know, there's, there's certain things that are continuous um, with, I think, the Obama-Trump continuity. Like when Trump got elected, we all thought, oh, you know, there's going to be more deportations. Well, the uptick is really in detentions because that's what makes the big bucks for, for the, the private detention companies, right? That's what's really the industry is here. That's right. what they're doing. So, I mean, there's a lot of continuities over time, and I think that's what historians do. The other thing I want to say about how the story got lost that's really important is it got lost, but it, it got lost for a particular reason, which is because the people that I write about, the American Committee for the Protection of for the Foreign Board, were accused of being communists. So their story carries this per, carried a taint during the Red Scare that persists into the present day, so we don't take people who have that taint of you know, associating with the Communist Party or being communist or being Marxist inspires, that's something that doesn't get its due by even professional historians. There's a little bit of a sense like, well, the American Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born, they were a communist front organization. So that, and, and first of all, they weren't. And second of all, even if they were, if they were doing what they did, which is organizing in immigrant communities around the country, winning deportation cases, making alliances between native born and foreign born people. Isn't that interesting anyway, but there's a, people haven't studied it before. And I studied it not because I'm so smart, but because I wasn't that afraid of associating with dead communists. Right. So, um, a, a lot of the book does, uh, focus around this group, the American uh, committee for the protection of, of the foreign born, which was, I guess, later sort of folded into the ACLU. Um, but mm-hmm. talk about, the circumstances that gave rise to um, the need for an organization like this, how were deportations sort of first uh, weaponized and against who? Right. I mean, it's always been both. And so the American committee comes out of, they come out out of actually um, a combination between the coalition between the international labor defense, which is a communist legal, like they, they helped defend Sacco and Benzetti. They helped, they helped to send, um, sort of organizers who were accused of, who got in trouble, and the ACLU. So it comes out of those two organizations. So if you think about the uptick in deportations that's associated with the Palmer raids and the first Red Scare after World War I. So big names are like Emma Goldman, Marcus Garvey. But the little names, like, you know, this this has an effect on, um, you know, famous leaders like that. But it it also is targeted at, people who are leaders in their communities whose names we don't know. And this, you know, the, the communist-inspired ILD, the liberal ACLU, are aware of the threat, the threats that this has. I mean, I was just thinking about this, listening to um, a podcast about the citizenship question on the census that's now being kicked to the Supreme Court. You know, so it's, it's a very similar thing in terms of the chilling effect on foreign-born communities. And these both organizations were aware of this. So it was decided that neither organization could deal with the caseload that was starting to, you know, of just deportations. And this is, so we're getting into late 20s, early 30s, and we're starting to get people like 
German, foreign-born Germans who are here, who are in danger because they are they have progressive politics. They're in danger of being deported back to Hitler's Germany or, you know, people who are being deported back to other fascist countries, Mussolini's Italy, places like that. So this comes to the attention of both organizations, and they realize they need to start kind of a, a semi-independent organization, which is the genesis of the American Committee. So it really starts, it's very East Coast focused. It's very focused around kind of um, the deportation of foreign-born progressives. But my argument in the book is the, because it's a decentralized organization, so the, the main office is always in New York, it's always tiny, it's always part of the left. So they're down the hall for a while from W.E.B. Du Bois. They associate with kind of progressive left circles in New York. But other committees for the protection of the foreign-born form when there's a crisis. So there's an early crisis in the Lackawanna Valley in Pennsylvania around the deportation of this woman, Stella Petrowski, who, you know, is a minor's wife um, during the 30s. She, they get divorced. She has 12 kids. She's trying to feed them. She gets involved with welfare relief. They tag her as a communist and try and deport her, which is a signal move. Like someone's making trouble say they're a communist, figure out that they're, they didn't, for whatever reason, naturalize, you can get rid of them. So the Lackawanna Committee for the Protection of the Foreign-Born Forms, the New York lawyers um, are working with them. So as that process goes on and there's, um, you know, different committees that spring up around the country, the East Coast-focused lawyers and advocates learn about other contexts. So even though they're focused kind of on Europeans at the beginning, they start to learn about, you know, Mexican Americans in the Southwest. They learn a lot, you know, I have a whole chapter on foreign born um, maritime laborers who are this multiracial workforce that basically win World War II by keeping the shipping lanes open. We're letting anyone join the merchant marine. We don't care about your citizenship papers. We don't care. Just join. It's kind of like now the army says, oh, you know, you're undocumented, no problem. We'll fix your papers. And then they, you know, you, you serve two years in Afghanistan and they forget to fix your papers and you get deported. The exact same thing happened to veterans of the merchant marine after the war and they were getting deported in droves and a lot of them were stateless. And, and the American committee kind of recognizes the problem even if they hadn't worked with those specific populations before. So they become much more multiracial as different immigrant groups come under the purview of the deportation terror. Yeah. Um, so it, it seems like, uh, you know, when we apply for a, a green card or naturalization, we still have to answer this question about communism. We have to ask our clients, yeah. You know, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And most of our clients look at us like, you know, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's interesting that the these sort of echoes of those uh, those old policies still exist. And and now somebody like Maru in Tacoma isn't you know being targeted as being a communist, but in her um, you know her ICE evidence packet or whatever it does specifically cite the fact that you know hey you know, this lady's talking trash about us. And so right. we had to do or something. Or the Scott Warren trial, right? So they're like, it's not humanitarian, it's political. Like, really, you're going to split hairs about this without water in the desert? But they are. That's the government's whole case against it. It's like, it was political. Like, even if you were leaving water in the desert for political reasons, isn't that just a good thing? But no, if we can say, like, no, it wasn't humanitarian, it was political. Like, what the heck? And I, I do think the antecedents of that are anti-communism. Right. Um, what and of, of my friend Amitabha Kumar used to tell a story about an older man who was trying to immigrate from India, and he was asked somehow during his, his immigration interview, um, have you ever tried to overthrow a government by force or persuasion? And he thought he had to pick one. So he said, <laughs> only persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, it didn't go well. I had a client say yes to that once, that question. <laughs> and luckily, really? Yeah, luckily we have a laid back office where they sort of knew that this, uh, you know, Campesino who probably, you know, studied the, the second grade or whatever was not actively trying to overthrow the government. So they asked it again and clarified and it was a no the second time, but, um, Do you know what he meant? What's, like, what, or was it, did he just mishear it? He, he didn't understand the question and his dad who was sitting next to him, his elderly dad, who was probably like 85, whispered see sí, see sí. like yeah, say yes and the client was like uh yeah so um a lot of times we we end up stuck with really bad interpreters um uh -huh. it, this is like a 
you know, we're told this is a really important agency. I mean, it is right. Deciding who can stay and who can't. And then, uh, a lot of these USCIS offices will be like, bring your nephew to come interpret for you to this Mm -hmm. critical interview where we're going to decide, you know, the future of your entire family and, and your, uh, you know, 18 year old nephew who barely speaks Spanish is going to be your interpreter. Anyways, uh, that's a conversation for another time, I guess. But, um, so this is really interesting. You know, I, I'm curious, uh, about, uh, farm workers and, you know, you, you talk about in the book operation wetback and, and, mm-hmm. uh, these policies that seem to sort of come into place, uh, when there's a, a downtick in the economy and it, it becomes easier to sort of scapegoat, uh, Immigrants, are, are you worried at all that like we're seeing this a, a similar pattern now when things more or less seem to be doing okay economically? I mean, what yeah, what, I mean, what would happen if I, if we did have a depression or a recession? It seems like you know we should be on the lookout for that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, a year ago. I think it was, it's hard to keep track in this regime because every day is a new set of horrors, right? But about a year ago, Trump started talking about um, something that was like, actually the language was lifted from Operation Wetback. And I don't think he's a very good historian. It was just, you know, I'm not actually convinced that Eisenhower had, was responding to economics. I really think, and I try to argue in that chapter that Operation Wetback was Eisenhower's West Point size thinking about the wetback, the so-called wetback problem as a military problem. And I think that's why he enlists his old pal, Joseph Swing, who's just back from training the troops in Korea. And I think Swing is thinking about it as a military problem. I mean, I don't know if first says, hey, Joe, will you just go clean up the wetback problem? Will you take the Sixth Army and go, go to the border and clean up the wetback problem? And Swing, who's his classmate from West Point, says, you know, I, I think that's a bad idea. <laughs> Because I, those guys shoot to kill, and they're trying to shoot on sight. I'm like, do you really want that to happen at the border? And I goes, well, maybe not, but could you could you fix it? I'm going to make you INS commissioner. But it's it's a military move, and I think that's the parallel, you know that, and that's what we're seeing at the border now. I mean, with the actual army there, and with the militarization that's being called up, you know, and because of the tariff threat, you know that 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 this has to be part of national security. I'm not convinced, except rhetorically, that that, that this responds to anything economic. What 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 was the thing that was a you know supposedly needing fixed? I mean, what what did Eisenhower perceive the problem to be? He just he just he, he was like, there's all these illegals at the border. It's messy. It's out of control. I mean, this this go, this is part of a much longer struggle, which is documented really beautifully in my colleague Kelly Little Hernandez's book, Migra, where um, you know the the ranch interests in the Southwest in Texas really see undocumented people as kind of their, their migrants. Like, you know, they're, they're, these are, these are people who are not a threat. These are people who are, are docile and we need them. You know, we still need them. Right. And so it's, it's the struggle, I think, between local interests who really want undocumented migration and then kind of ascendant, the, the idea of ascendant national security order. So, I think there is an economic element, but I think it's primarily rhetorical. It's like now, like, you know, the explanation for why anyone is on any white person is unemployed is that, you know, undocumented people are taking your jobs, undocumented people are menacing your families. But I think the operation is much more about order and militarism and um, building up the forces at the border. Right. Well, and isn't it interesting that, you know, you gave the, the example of the, uh, I'm going to call them boat workers, but they're not called boat workers, but the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> maritime, maritime laborers yes. is what I say to avoid saying who, seamen all the time. <laughs> right. Who were instrumental in, you know, keeping certain functions alive and, and going during world war two. But in the, in the same way, you know, the, uh, the guest worker program, the Bracero program functioned in much the same way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these people were praised during the war and, it didn't take long at all for, for the government to decide these same people were actually a problem. Well, and it's weird because 
what operation went back at 54, the Bracera program goes till 64. So really the complaint is much more about labor docility, right? It's not that they're coming here. It's not that they're working here. It's that, and this happens a lot with Bracera, right? People, people come over, they're at a ranch where they're like not getting paid or fed. They're like, you know, screw this. I'm going to go look somewhere else for work. Then they become undocumented or, I'm here, I've been working here off and on for four years, I'm going to try and bring my wife. And those are the undocumented people. That's the illegality spiral that happens with Bracero. So the messiness is caused by economic necessity. And and nobody's saying during Operation Wetback, hey, well, maybe if we're really worried about these people coming here, maybe we should end the contract labor program that brings them here. No, no, right? It's like, we, no, we need those guys. We just want them. I mean, it's always about docility. Right. We want people to have to stay on the ranch that's not paying them. We don't want them to like be able to have, you know, any portability or any any mobility or to be able to choose what their family life is like. Right. You know, this is about disciplining and scare and intimidating and scaring them. And that song remains the same. Like immigrant, you know, some some people, some undocumented people, as you know, are leaving, but more are driven into more and more precarious, scary lives. And they're here. Their lives are here. Their economic economic households are here. They need to be here for whatever reason. But it's terrifying to be here. Right. And uh, they're not going to – like we had a whole spate of cases um, here where people, undocumented people, would get injured on the job, try to claim some kind of workman's comp, and the company would say, sure, and we're going to call <laughs> we're gonna call ICE when we call the company. And, like, you know, then you're not going to make any medical claims, Right. Right. It's interesting too. I mean, just sort of, you know, my congressman. I'm in a, a conservative district, and at the same time, he's sort of propping up Trump's immigration enforcement priorities, and we're detaining and deporting like able-bodied, <laughs> hard-working men and women. Um, he's calling for basically an increased or a, a bolstered uh, guest worker program. And mm-hmm. it just seems like this is an issue that we've never been able to really <laughs> resolve in any meaningful way. Um, yeah. So how do you, like, this is something I, I think about a lot. Like how, what would your fix be? Like what's, what's a just, is there a just contract worker program? Are we against borders entirely? You know, how, like, cause it, it is this huge contradiction and it's hard to think through the policy fix for it. Yeah. Um, well, I think there's some easy things you could do to start, like by paying living wages and making the jobs <laughs> more competitive. I do think, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but you know, one of the issues with the guest worker program or the Bracero program is it, it it's also a form of family separation. And you know, we talk about family separation. Right. That's a very right. big deal, but you know, going back to the early Bracero program, uh, you know, you could only bring the men. And and if you think about what it would do to any culture to have men just take off for half the year, uh, leaving behind, you know, their women and children, um, you know, that that's not a good thing for uh, Mexico or Mexican families. And so, you know, it, I think we need to be consistent on that, too. Um, Mm -hmm. but, uh, I'm curious, you know, we were pretty hard on the Democrats, uh, from the left because it seems like at least since Bill Clinton, um, the Democrats have been pretty, uh, pretty lame on immigration, pretty much lockstep with the Republicans for the most part. And Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if that's always been the case or if there was ever a time when, a you know, a political party, either party, had really good, bold ideas on immigration. You know, I mean, I think um, I think it's important, and we're seeing this now, right? When you have politicians like Ilhan Omar or Ocasio Cortez, who are first or second generation, and this was true in the period I write about, you have. Um, politicians who are coming out of immigrant communities and are more in touch with them and are more responsive. So, you know, one thing the American committee does is lobby various senators for better policy. You know, they're never as good leftists. They're rarely satisfied, but they do push for 
um, reforms, they're pretty unhappy. And this is pretty interesting to me, even though I think liberals tend to like the 1965 reform. The American committee really hate it because it doesn't abolish the statute of limitations on deportation. Um, so you can still have retroactive deportation. It doesn't, um, it, it, it doesn't really do for the communities that they're representing. So I think that, that it's really important that we have first and second generation politicians in Congress now as then. But somebody like, um, uh, uh, Lehman, who's an advocate in many ways, is responsive particularly to sort of white ethnic communities, particularly Jewish communities that he comes out of. And my colleague Libby Garland writes about this. In some ways, he, you know, even the refugee policy that we see coming in after World War II, responsive to the Holocaust and other things, and to the 1951 UN um, High Commission on Refugees, um, that that in a way opens the door for Operation Wetback because it says, you know, refugees are the special category and refugees have rights, whereas so-called economic migrants don't. And you and I both know, I, uh, you know, really that distinction is, is is so dangerous and has been so malicious in the lives of, of actually people on the move, you know, like whether you can prove that you have the right to move and, you know, whether, you know, starving in Guatemala is more meritorious than being politically repressed in another place. Like that, that's such a, so, so yes, kind of, I mean, I, I, kind of there, there are politicians that are somewhat responsive and we'll have to see, right. As this, as this um, generation of uh, the 20, 2018 generation of first year Congress people that does have some progressive first generation voices in it, you know, how, how they cut that deal. I think with Obama, I really think that the rise, you know, with Reagan of of immigrant detention as a federal, a private federal partnership, I think that's incredibly destructive. I think I think all of the the presidents since then played directly into the growth of that complex in the name of law and order. And the other big thing is 9/11. So you marry national security policy with immigration policy, and it, it is literally impossible to pass national comprehensive immigration reform. The only laws we've had since 9-11 have been on the back of Homeland Security appropriations. Our, our Department of Immigration is now in Homeland Security. Like, you can't separate the two. So maybe it's, it feels more inexorable now, but it was tough then, too. Right. You make a really interesting point about how the asylum laws uh, were good on the one hand. On the other hand, they created this division, which is harmful to other people. We often hear... You know, somebody comes from a small town that's been overrun by cartels and they're finding heads or bodies of people, you know, strewn in the street or strung up, you know, under an overpass or whatever. And the judges will say, well, yes, but the violence is indiscriminate, which means everybody might get killed. And therefore, right. they're not from a group. And therefore, you're not persecuted. It's just right. random violence. And so you aren't protected. And, uh, and in some cases, I mean, not, it's not always the case, but in some cases, you know, it, it might actually be worse to be, uh, subject to, uh, randomized violence, depending on how, you know, how strong the, the violence is. But, um, those people just aren't even considered. It's hard to even get, uh, the judge to begin to think of the case once they, you know, they'll, they'll ask these sort of trap questions like, well, um, couldn't these things happen to anyone in your community? And, right. and the respondent will often say, well, yeah, you know, it could. Right. And that's, so the, to, that's to the a normal nail. person that, that means it's all the more horrible and there's all the more reason to flee. But under our asylum laws, it's, it means, oh, well, you know, you're not from the protected group. So, so screw you. I mean, this, and in a funny way, like this is where the communism thing comes back around, right? Because what, what is needed is a, a systematic, analysis, an internationalist analysis that says, well, you know, the reasons you might have to leave Honduras for me and my classes, right? Well, let's start with United Fruit, right? And the immiseration of peasantry and, and smallholders in Guatemala and Honduras. Like, let's not even talk about the dirty wars. Let's just talk about the, the, the ability to feed your family as it's completely undermined by United Fruit starting around 1920, right? So if we want to Think about why somebody from Honduras might want to leave. Let's just forget about the politics. Forget about the two, 2009 coup. Let's just say it's like fucking impossible to make a living in Honduras, right? right? Starting with United Fruit, unless you're essentially an indent, a slave or an indentured servant to United Fruit, which has its consequences and its terror. You know, 
and that's not that's not ever allowed to come into our policy discussions under a sort of liberal nationalist system. So we're always stuck with this deserving and undeserving individualist. You know, and like we actually really badly need a, a systematic internationalist analysis of our foreign policy. But like, you know, I'm blown away when, you know, one of the like Ilhan Omar, for example, when she talks about immigration as like part of a world system, like, no, we're not allowed to do that politically. Like we do it at the university all the time, which is why there's such a right wing attack on the university. But that's another story. But it's not something that comes that's allowed to come into our policy debate to talk about international politics and their fallout in people needing to leave their countries and winding up at our borders. You know, like, I, I, I love the Somali British poet Warsan Shir, who says, like, nobody, nobody, nobody puts their kid in a leaky boat unless the water's safe on the land. Nobody wants to leave. But there are systematic reasons. But we're sort of not allowed to think about this. It must drive you guys crazy. Well, I think that uh, actually the universities are under attack because you guys are attacking free speech. So There's that. There's that. Um, there's that. We're working on that. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, no, there was a, yeah, I mean, I could go long on that, but this is an immigration podcast. Yeah, and I, can't, I guess like, uh, you know, counterfactuals are are difficult or impossible, not always useful, but you can kind of imagine like what the United States would be like if every 20 or 30 years, like Canada came in and like murdered our president or you know, installed a, a new dictator or, or just decided that like, no, 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 you guys you guys don't really know what you want. This is what we're going to do. And, right. and, and, uh, did the bidding of like, you know, big corporate interests and, and things like that. Um, you know, if like, uh, I don't know, Lyndon Johnson had been, uh, run out of office by the Canadian government. Um, but anyhow, yeah, I mean, it's so important that people know the history and to kind of understand where we are. I'm curious, uh, maybe as a last question, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but, um, you know, we get a lot of people who are either activists themselves or they're activist curious and they want to know, Mm -hmm. you know, what can I do? How can I get involved? What are the, the takeaways from the past that you think are most important for uh, people like that to know moving forward? You guys in the Northwest, there's such a good, there's such good immigrant rights organizations like the Northwest. Mm, You would know the names better than me, but like I'm impressed by the organizations that are working out there. Um, You know, there's this moment, you know, I had this this sort of archival nightmare when I was reading the files of the American committee because they get listed for the, um, um, Attorney General Subversive Organizations list in 1955, and they get like a flood of letters. This was really an amazing afternoon for me because most of them are from, you know, liberal ministers, professors like me, um, you know, people who aren't in, directly involved with the struggle but who've been sending, who, who are members saying, like, please take me off your list. I can't afford to be associated with you anymore. And, like, honestly, given the you know, freezing of assets with Mexican immigrant rights organizations like um, Pueblo Sin Fronteras and the arrests of leaders in Mexico. Like, I think we're in a period where immigrant rights and immigrant rights organizing the harassment of electoral leaders at the border is more and more demonized. So it's really important to do garden variety things like, you know, send a $15 check, turn up at a rally. It's not hard to find an organization in your town. And I don't know if, I don't know if your website has lists organizations, but, you know, I, I love the National Network for Immigration, Immigrant and Refugee Rights or FIRM, or there's a lot of national networks that can point you to local ones, but I, I think it's important to turn up. Like, it was pretty inspiring to me last summer with the so-called family separation crisis, you know, and I, as you rightly point out, you know, this is all a family separation crisis. Deportation is always a family separation crisis, but, you know, everywhere in the country, in these tiny little towns, there were rallies. That was pretty cool. And that, like, I think it's easy to think that that doesn't matter, that you went, you know, you spent your Saturday at noon with your family going down to the square and, and seeing other folks. But it does, like, that visible support allows folks like you and, you know, folks like that, the heroes of Al Trilado and other things to keep doing their work. And it also makes that work visible and protected. So, I mean, it's really easy to just feel hopeless in this time, but it's really important to turn up for that stuff, I think. Right. And maybe like even more important than that, buy your book and become a patron of this show. Like those are the things. Yes, that, that too. 
and look for A is for Asylum Seeker, which will be on shelves in spring of 2020 in time for the election. Oh, and nice. hopefully we'll be, you know, like in the woke consumer aisle, as my kids call it, of Urban Outsiders. So I haven't gone <laughs> firm that, up that piece of it yet. Next to like a coffee table book of old album covers or something like that, right? <laughs> right, exactly. That's the plan. <laughs> All right, Rachel Ida Buff. The book is Against the Deportation Terror, Organizing for Immigrant Rights in the 20th Century. Thank you so much. And when the new book drops, we'll have you back on or anytime in between. That's how people awesome. get it was on really the show. Fun. I'm but... a huge fan of the pod. Thank you so much for doing it. I listen religiously and it makes me feel like I know what's going on. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much and uh, have a good weekend. You too. Take care. Bye, Steve. So, Matthew. Steven. Steven. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. How are you? I'm good. Good interview. Is it inspiring or depressing to know that, like, we're fighting the same fight that's been fought for a hundred years or longer? Or both? (laughs) <laughs> maybe both I don't know maybe both but I, what I find interesting is when you're your discussion about how about how <clears throat> the these things happen earlier in her um what she was talking about when we were in a depression and time of war and all that stuff and and maybe that like seems easier to understand right like during the depression, during a time of great economic turmoil, I guess one can maybe more readily understand um, anti-immigrant attitude. Not that it would be correct, but I'm guessing if you know you're without a job and you're on the verge of homelessness, or you're homeless, and you know you're going to soup kitchens, you know, and maybe you're looking around and saying, "Hey, maybe we really don't want immigrants." Here, especially if you would see an immigrant who is doing better than yourself. But, you know, but what's scary now is, right, we're at a time of, you know, relatively, relative prosperity, right? I mean, I, I, I think it's probably overblown by this administration uh, how well the economy is. But general, than- we're not, we're not in a depression, right? Right. So the fact that we have the same attitudes now um, I, I think st- it says a little bit that it's not necessarily economics, right? Right. And I think that, you know, that's what she said about Operation Wetback, that it was exactly, really sort yeah. of untied to, to economics. And it is interesting, you know, I, what I will say, I mean, I think that you can have uh, racism and xenophobia, obviously, even among like really wealthy, well-to-do people who've never been harmed by anything ever, Um, but you know, I, I think that, um, some people, I remember, so my nemesis on Facebook, this uncle who I've talked about (laughs) talking to him like 15 or 20 years ago and, you know, he's a pretty, uh, simple guy, uh, no higher education, hardworking guy. And he seemed to have like a fairly sophisticated understanding of how, we were being totally screwed by NAFTA. Now I think they often get like the enemies wrong, right? Like the, the takeaway is not always correct, but there is this sort of understanding that like things are not great for me. And there, and there are these things that are, you know, unjust or going wrong. And then somewhere, you know, the wires get crossed and the takeaway is like, so, you know, Hillary should be in jail. Although right. it's not, I mean, there's no, it, it's funny of uh, a group of people who will talk at great lengths about personal responsibility. Um, how, you know, people shouldn't be on welfare and, you know, all these handouts and snowflakes and, you know, everyone should be responsible for themselves and this and that. They cannot look inwards to say, Maybe some decisions in, you know, choices I made in my life led to me being in this situation. You know, it's always, well, you know, the government screwed me, immigrants screwed me, some other unknown 
you know, foreign government screwed me or something. Or how about um, like a wealthy corporation that like, I, you know, well, I, I mean, that's what you strive to be. So they can't be the <laughs> well. I mean, that's the thing, like with the, the working yeah. class here and the working poor, they want to be wealthy. So that is their idolization, rich people. Right. So you don't want to blame your heroes <laughs> and your idols for your problems because Maybe then they don't, they're I'll, not your heroes. Right. Maybe someday I'll be Google. And so, uh, or, you know, I'll be uh, Ford. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, um, no, what I, what I do think is interesting is when you look at the 1924 Immigration Act that restricted immigration from um, basically everywhere except northern western europe um and you look at the the parallels for today where now we want this merit-based system that is going to effectively restrict immigration from a lot of places where people are a little darker um than the preferred uh skin tone total coincidence yeah you know you you start to draw these parallels as uh the professor was saying um you know, how things that are seem new are really not new, right? Uh, um, the Muslim ban, you know, we for a long time, well, first we banned the Chinese and then, you know, uh, Jewish you know, refugees had a hard time getting into the United States. So it is, it, it's interesting when you say, is it depressing or, you know, or whatever you said, <laughs> that you know, we're fighting the same battles. I guess maybe it's depressing because I always look at as this country as progressing. Like, mm-hmm. I always think that this country is progressing, that we're making progress. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just hopeful that this time frame that we're living in is really just a, a blip and we, we keep making progress. Right. There was, there is this sort of a thread throughout the book that I, I wanted to bring up, but I didn't, which is this sort of refrain that we're a country of immigrants, which is like factually true, right? It's, it's a descriptor, but I think when people say it, they're trying to communicate something that's actually very untrue, which is we're a country of immigrants and we have some sort of history of being like, welcome welcoming or good to immigrants is what they mean and that part of the sentiment is totally wrong (laughs) right well we're a country of immigrants we accept immigrants either openly or begrudgingly or we just whatever and only after those immigrants toil are persecuted discriminated against shit upon and climb out of that and are able to establish themselves in the United States, do we recognize their, their immigrant past as being worthy? Right. right? So the, the Italian, you know, the, the third generation Italian family um, who has a small business and who's, or, you know, are becoming um, outstanding members of a community, they can say, oh, look at that immigrant story that immigrant success story, but most likely that first Italian immigrant that came over was shit upon. It was treated like crap. Um, And we didn't accept, we we weren't saying, Oh, look at this success story. We're saying, look at this burden upon our society. So um, I think you're right. We should uh, refocus how we, we, we look at us as um, a nation of immigrants. Right. So, um, what else is going on? Anything else you want to talk about? I got a bond hearing then waiting for the judge to call, but I mean, if there's not a lot going on in the old world of immigration. No, no. Well, it's interesting. And and I think we're going to have to delve into this, into um, some other, um, some, some of the next shows about this uh, thing about the thirds or the safe country agreements that we're supposedly entering into with Mexico and now um, maybe perhaps Guatemala. The, so what, briefly, this would be an agreement where we would say with Mexico, hey, anyone that comes in the United States that traveled through your country that's not Mexican and is seeking asylum, we can send them back to you and they have to seek asylum there. 
Mm-hmm. But now they even want to take it down to Guatemala. So anyone from El Salvador or Honduras enters into Guatemala, we say, and they come up here, we send them back to Guatemala and say, hey, Guatemala is a safe country for you. So therefore, you have to seek asylum there. I mean, you can almost be- maybe make a case for Mexico, right? And, and I think it's a kind of a, a really far-fetched case for Mexico. But for Guatemala, that's absolutely insane. <laughs> right. I think Mexico would be insane. Uh, but, uh, I mean, but, but so in, in, if you're doing insanity scales, Mexico's <laughs> insane. Guatemala is, I know we get bleep now in this thing, but is pretty bleeping, really bleeping insane. Right. Um, well, so the producer is on vacation. Oh, okay. You, you can swear. And I, I might, I mean, I'm going to have to go back and cut out that part about the basketball because that was lame. I feel like, I feel like I was lame, but, um, yeah, it's, um, I'm curious what that does to asylum seekers from those countries, because I mean, you can be from Guatemala and win asylum, you know, not easily, but it's a pretty common. Well, yeah. Do you, do, does the government, well, so if you're from Guatemala, you're going to be sent back to Mexico, right? Oh, um, right. If they're both safe third countries, then. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I mean, now I guess Guatemala is having an election soon. So there's a lot of talk about that. You know, like this, they don't really want to talk about this too much because it could affect, um, could sway the election there. Um, but that's just crazy to think Guatemala could be a safe third country. I, it's just, um, but it's interesting. Well, it would be interesting to see how how it how it plays out. Right now, there's also been. Um, we'll definitely keep an eye on that. Um, it there have also been a lot of these stories coming out about um, people dying in detention. There was we were going to talk to uh, Ken Klippenstein uh, last week, and then I nearly died. Um, but he uh, please. He, he got a, <laughs> internal memos from ICE where uh, there were some whistleblowers saying, hey, um, it seems like people are dying that uh, we could very easily keep from not dying. And, and maybe we should keep them from not dying. And uh, so uh, there was that. And then there was also this sort of internal report about just general conditions, which were and are uh, totally appalling. Was that a surprise to you? Well, it's surprised that someone in in ICE cared enough to blow the whistle. I think maybe that's a surprise. I mean, it's not a surprise to me about the the conditions of these uh, individuals and how they're treated or not treated. Um, I think anyone who's worked in deten- with detention case or detained cases understands that you know the the medical care they receive is horrendous and and this isn't new like so don't think that this is a new thing it might be exasperated because of um what's going on down at the border and not necessarily because of the amount of people coming in but the way that they're handling that they're they're stifling them at the border they're keeping them locked up longer at the border uh, but i had a case years ago in new jersey in a detention center in new jersey and the guy was an intense intense you might be able to uh, relate to this but he had intense intense abdominal pains Mm -hmm. and it was he was actually like people had to carry him down to the medical office and they're like oh well the doctor only comes in twice a week you have to wait and when the doctor came in the doctor gave him a shot of anesthesia in his stomach (laughs) to ease the pain Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not a doctor, but even to me, that it sounds absolutely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So he had a bond and his family was trying to raise the money for the bond. And he kept saying, can you get them to take him to a real hospital? And, I, and the answer was, no, they're not going to do it. I mean, I was trying. I said, the answer is pay his bond, <laughs> get him out. They paid his bond and they took him immediately to the emergency room and his gallbladder was just about to burst. And I even, I spoke to the doctor about it and, and the doctor was like, the doctor didn't believe me that he had gotten anesthesia for the pain. 
he did not believe me. We had to wait and get the medical records. This is a doctor who, like, uh, if you go in with a headache, he just sticks a syringe in your skull. <laughs> <laughs> but it's crazy. But if that guy had, imagine if he didn't get bonded out and that, and that gallbladder burst, he probably would have died. Yeah, um, certainly, I would think. So, so yeah, th- this does not... You know, this does not surprise me at all. It does surprise me that someone blew the whistle. So if it. You, but if you think about it, so you take a situation like that, which existed years ago, as you're saying, um, I've had similar experiences, maybe not quite as dramatic, but seeing similar things. And if you take that system and then you inject it with steroids and say, now we're going to detain even more people and we're going to, um, you know, make it even harder for ICE to exercise discretion um, or impossible for them to do so and and parole people or let them go, you know, what do you think is going to happen? I I think one of the main issues here is, you know, anytime you have profit motive in, uh, you know, sometimes profit motive is great. Like if you want to sell a bunch of ice cream, uh, well, there should still be like some regulations so that you don't, you know, poison or whatever. But, uh, you know, you want to sell as much ice cream as you, as you can. So you try and make a good product, like whatever. Um, and we don't need to get into all of that, but with things like healthcare, when when there's a a profit motive, you have a real motivation to deny somebody coverage. In fact, covering somebody hurts your bottom line. And if that's your primary motivation, uh, not delivering, you know, healthcare services or, or providing care for people, but, maximizing profits that's a problem and and with detention i mean there's zero reason for these corporations which are set up to make hundreds of millions of dollars a year there's no reason for them to like buy nicer mattresses or have a doctor who's there all of the time right but it's also beyond right the 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 private detention centers, we're seeing now more and more people held in the Hileros, the, the, the ice boxes for longer and longer periods of time. For years, I would talk to, so when people would cross over the border, they'll, uh, the border patrol will put them in these big warehouses with cages and you now there'd be concrete floors and they're given those aluminum foil uh, blankets that you'll see that they hand out to marathon runners at the end of marathons. And, you know, traditionally they've been there for a day to maybe three days. Right. Um, and that's horrible. I mean, lots of times they're there with their children and they're sleeping. It's very cold in there. Um, you don't have any mattresses. It's horrible. You know, and it's horrible for, you know, a couple hours. It's horrible for, you know, a day or two days. But now I'm getting people that have been there for weeks or two weeks. And so the condition that the the migrants may be in, even when they cross the border, they might not be in the healthiest condition from the journey, but they're going to deteriorate rapidly in these conditions. And then now they're placed in these private detention centers where but they don't the the emphasis is not going to be on medical care and right. it seems and so like it's not it's not shocking at all that people are dying it's probably shocking that more people aren't dying right now this is a a horrible practice no matter who's in in office i think um you could imagine a situation where you had an administration that cared but the the situation was maybe they were temporarily overwhelmed by circumstances, the number of crossers or, you know, whatever lack of resources. And they need time to adjust to the the circumstances on the ground. What we have now, and again, not to excuse any type of humanitarian abuses by any other administration, including the Obama administration, but you could imagine a situation like that. But what we have now is an administration that I think very clearly wants these stories to, to get out in a way like for Stephen Miller and, and president Trump and, and the rest of these people, a story about how, you know, oops, we accidentally killed some people is uh, the kind of deterrent that they've been looking for. If anything, I mean, so do you think maybe the whistleblower is really like Stephen Miller? 
<laughs> Stephen Miller wrote a memo like, hey, uh, hey, people are dying. People are dying and being tortured. Wink, wink. Uh, super sad. But I mean, we do have to go back to Obama because this started really when we seen these family units started in about 2014. And they really did the only facilities that they created. I mean, they created Artesia, um, which people with a historical memory will know was this kind of um, was by Area 51 in New Mexico. And it was this, this family detention center that grew up out of the desert of tents and all that. And was really in the middle of nowhere, had very um, hard to access for attorneys. Uh, but they kind of started that. But still, they didn't, they never really increased capacity for Border Patrol and all that. And I think Obama, his plan was just to kind of more and more release these individuals. Um, and I guess he didn't foresee someone like Trump who is going to try to just detain all these individuals down there in more and more harsh and harsh conditions. But you're right. I think for the Trump admini- for the Obama administration, it would have been seen as a terrible thing, um, even though maybe they they would have caused it, but they would have been you know, horrified at these reports. The Trump administration, um, yeah, I think they, I think they probably see these reports as a positive. Right. Uh, um, so another, do you have- another, another uplifting <laughs> episode of redirect immigration law and perspectives. Yeah. Our government's killing people and they like it. And this is bring your, bring your daughter to the podcast. Get her to listen. Going to have another sunny weekend. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful here. The weather here is beautiful. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, do you have a good story you'd like to share since that's, uh, you know, we're trying to do that thing where we're not just depressing all the time? Did I tell about my Nicaraguan kid who won asylum? I think I might have. Um, you told me. I don't know if you, if maybe you did mention it on the podcast. I, did. I mean, you know, the thing is, like, we are getting things approved u visas are getting approved green cards are getting approved um and those things can dramatically change people's lives um and so i'll tell this quick story there's one judge here in philadelphia who left he went to baltimore uh judge verma Mm -hmm. uh, dinesh verma he was uh, a um, a private practitioner. He became an immigration judge. Even though he lived in Maryland, they, they put him in uh, Philadelphia and he was traveling back and forth. So finally, he, there was an opening in Baltimore and he went there. And on his last day, I had a hearing with him. And before we went on the record, I told him, I said, Hey, judge, I don't know if you remember, but I had a client about a year ago that you granted asylum for. And she was working as while well, she was getting asylum as a, a line prep cook at this um, nice hotel in Philadelphia. But now since she got asylum, you know, she's, um, she's one of the head, one of the head sous chefs there. Um, her life has really progressed. Every time I would see her before she was granted asylum, she was very nervous and depressed. Now she's very happy and she, um, she has a much better outlook on life. And I could really see how, the grant of asylum transformed her. And I said, you know, I just wanted you to know that you do have the ability to touch people and to make their lives better. And so he was like really appreciative. He had remembered my client. Um, But that's something I, I think that we do as much as depressing things as we talk about, but we do have that. It is really, really rewarding to see, um, people in that situation. Right. And I know, I know you have a lot of, you know, similar cases like that where you see people who are in such a state of despair, and then whenever their case is resolved, either through a U visa, permanent residence, asylum, um, how they can really be transformed. Right. One of the, you know, uh, asylum is great, and uh, you know, lots of these forms of relief are great. One of my favorite things to be able to to do is to uh, uh, get somebody a permit, either their green card or uh, what's called advanced parole, a permit to uh, be able to travel back to their country and come back. Because, uh, you know, one thing that we I try to talk about on the show 
and I think is really either misunderstood or just not understood to, to be a problem at all is the fact that so many of the people who are here are really trapped here by the laws and, uh, you know, can't go back. I mean, they could go back, but then they'd be stuck over there having abandoned their family here. And so they're, they're in a double bind where they've got sick or dying family in Mexico for most of my clients. And, uh, meanwhile, they might have three or four kids in school and a good job here. And, um, when you're able to take somebody who's been here for 20 or 25 years and get them that permit and they come back having, you know, embraced their mother or father for the first time in decades and, you know, uh, been able to spend that time with their family, uh, you can feel it, you know, uh, just being in their presence. There is a, a real change, um, in their demeanor and their, their yeah. personality. Isn't it funny that sometimes the the main reason that people want some type of immigration papers, so to speak, is so they can actually leave the country? <laughs> you know, yeah, and you obviously, know. obviously, return. Yeah, I always tell people like you're always free to leave. Yeah, uh, it's a coming back part. But don't, don't you, I, I think one thing that one one feeling that immigration attorneys have that is probably universal is when you win that really tough case for that person. And they've really been on you the whole time and you they've been telling you how much it really means to them. And then you you give them that green card or work permit or whatever document it is that makes their life right. Um, and they just kind of go like, oh, OK. Yeah. And then they turn around and they just kind of like walk out like like you had handed them like uh, just a receipt. <laughs> like that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're expecting uh, like a big hug and a big thank you, and they're like, "Yeah, okay." I do great. find I I've been hugged lately unexpectedly by some people who I was like, "Oh, I, I like I didn't think that you were." So what goes on in the men's room? I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> They're not even clients. They're just you know, <laughs> yeah. Hugging me. Well, you're um, you're kind of a huggable guy. Well, that's true. Um, no, but like the clients who are happy. The thing I've come to to pe- come to peace with because I've seen lawyers complain about this lately. Like I won this hard case, and the client like didn't even thank me. Um, <laughs> is that? I think I just complained about that. <laughs> yeah, I think you just complained about it, but not quite in that voice. I mean, it was close, but. Um, is that I've come to terms with the fact that they do the majority of their celebrating, not in their fucking lawyer's office. Right. I mean, they go home, they probably sit in their car and, and, uh, you know, maybe have a cry or they have a big party that, you know, they're not going to invite us to. Uh, Well, and also, you know what, there are clients who have really been kind of like screwed over by the system. Right. Right. And and they're getting their thing. It's like, and it's not like, yay. it's like, it's about fucking time. Right. Right. You know, I appreciate that. Yeah. So I, I don't, I mean, I, I, (laughs) I just, I find it, I find it funny. I I find it funny. And, and I, I think I, I find it funny. I, I think I'm more laughing at myself right? because like I'm expecting something and you're right. Sometimes like, you know, you get someone like a work permit or something and they'll be like so overjoyed, mm-hmm. and you're like, "That was the easiest thing." Like, I've done yeah, year. right. <laughs> well, uh, I got to get going. Okay, I, d- I did have a, a U visa client who called for four years, like literally twice a month, to know how his case was going. And when we got the card, he goes, "What's that for?" Like when he, we, <laughs> what's that for? Um, oh, but you know, it's great with the UV's a client. And then they say, so can I travel? And you're like, <laughs> yeah. you're like, that one, like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> About that. Uh, all right, Matthew, good talking to you. Good talking to you. Have a good one. Have fun. Bye. Bye.